Good morning. Great to be with you. You join us in the middle of a sermon series going through the book of Matthew. In particular, we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached, where Jesus calls Christians and those that believe in him to live a life of radical devotion, where in every area of our life we are seeking to put him first and to worship him. This is in tune with when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he responded, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul. And the Ser- Sermon on the Mount talks into a range of topics about how we do this. How do we practically live out a life of devotion in a number of important areas? And the two topics we're going to be looking at this morning are wealth, which encompasses money and possessions, and also anxiety and worry. These are two prominent themes in scripture and also they're often themes that are linked to one another and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Wealth for example is mentioned in scripture you may have heard the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector and he was taking money off people that extra than he should have been collecting. He was essentially stealing from people and Jesus called him down from a tree, went to dinner with him and said to him, turn around from your sinful lifestyle where you are pursuing money, where you're stealing from people and instead turn to me and have your true reward and your riches. And we see a radical transformation in Zacchaeus' life. He pays back all the money he stole, but he also gives more than he stole back. That is the liberation of coming to know Jesus and the generosity that comes with that. We also see a story about the rich young ruler. He was someone who came and asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says to him, you know the Ten Commandments, you must not steal, you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, etc. And the rich young ruler says to him, I've done all of these things. Jesus says to him, what about your wealth? Are you willing to give that away? And he went away despondent. We see the choice here of choosing to hold on to our wealth, choosing to focus our energies, our resources and our heart in towards that. Or instead, like Zacchaeus, choosing to be liberated and live our lives for God and being generous with our money as a result. We also see anxiety is mentioned in scripture. One of these examples is Proverbs 12 verse 35 where it talks about anxiety weighing the heart down we've all experienced worry and anxiety particularly in these times as we're in the midst of this crisis and we know that it can have the impact of becoming all-consuming can become our focus and our devotion not necessarily because we want it to be but that's just the reality of our lives sometimes that's financial financially caused It's anxiety about how we're going to have enough money to pay our bills, to meet our living costs. And there we see the two are linked. But there's an amazing message this morning from this passage that we're going to read from Matthew 6, verse 19. And that is that Jesus calls us to live a life completely devoted to him, where we don't invest our energy and resources and our hearts in acquiring wealth, where we don't invest our hearts in being anxious and being worried, but instead we invest our hearts and our devotion and our worship entirely to him. And as a result of that, we will see true reward. We will see reward eternally as we spend eternity with him in heaven. But as we heard last week from Duncan, we will also be rewarded according to how we have lived out these things in our lives here. And that's a really exciting message for all of those who can call God our master and king. So I'm going to read from verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye is the lamp of the body. 
So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not, mu are you not worth much more than, than they? And who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We're going to be looking at wealth first of all. And that's from verses 19 to 24. We see here verses of contrast. Contrast between if we devote ourselves to storing up treasures that are of wealth or whether we devote ourselves to storing up treasures that are God himself. And we're going to be looking into three contrasts this morning from these verses. First of all, the contrast between heaven and earth. Secondly, the contrast between light and darkness. Thirdly, the contrast between God being our master or wealth being our master. You may have noticed that in verse 19 and 20, Jesus is very clear. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. He also says, do store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And this leads us to look at why. Why should we not store up treasures for ourselves? Which we know from verse 24 is wealth. Why should we not store up wealth for ourselves in this earth? And I think there's two reasons from this, this passage why we shouldn't do that. The first is in the word earth. That storing up wealth only has a short term shelf life. It's limited. We can't take it beyond this world. Once we die, we can't take our bank balance through. We can't take our collection of cars or our collection of houses. You might say, we, yes, we, we can pass them on to family members, to children, to grandchildren. And that's true in some cases. But even they, it's limited to their lives. No matter what time we invest in storing up wealth, for ourselves it's limited limited in that we can't take it beyond this earthly world but there's also a second reason why we shouldn't store up treasures for ourselves on earth and that's in the second half of verse 19 where it talks about moth and rust destroying and where thieves break in and steal this indicates that Acquiring and storing up wealth in this world, even in the here and now, it's futile because it's of limited value. It's temporary. It's not long lasting because it's going to decay. That's what moths indicate. It's going to decay. It's going to rust. It's going to lose its value, lose its worth. And sometimes it's even going to be stolen by thieves from us. And I know this to be true. I used to work in recruitment. And recruitment I'd probably describe as the epicentre of 
a sector that is all about acquiring and storing up wealth. All about that. You're targeted on how much money you, you bring into the company, determines whether you keep your job or not. You're incentivized to bring in loads of money because you get a percentage, you get your commission. And I know that even in months when I did well and I, I made placements and I, I got I received a commission from my company, I know that this this is true. I know that the lump of money that I did get in a in a specific month did decay. Because before I even was paid it, it was taxed. I lost the section for tax. And taxes are good to pay, and we should. But it decayed, lost its value. Then by the time it's actually in my bank account, and I've paid for jobs around the house, things that need fixing, I've booked the summer holiday, I've got the car repaired, suddenly the, the value of that money has significantly gone down because I've spent, if not all of it, most of it, it's lost its value. And I also know to be true from my, my time in that role that as you get a commission lump sum, there's something within you that you have to battle because you desire more. Let's say you've got 1,000 pounds. Well, you then want 2,000 pounds because you start to think about what could I do with 2,000 instead of 1,000? Could I upgrade my holiday? Could I upgrade my car? It loses value. And sometimes in recruitment, not known as the most integral of industries, other recruitment agencies can try and muscle in on your deals. Sometimes when you've, you've had a deal go through, they can call up the company and say, we introduced this candidate and get them to send a letter in and suddenly you, your fee, your fee might disappear. It might be stolen from you by another recruitment agency. I found in this anecdotal example, but in my life, and I know it, I know Jesus' words to be true, that acquiring material wealth, lots of possessions, it's of limited value even in this world. Things lose their value, they get stolen, they decay. So do we want to be investing all of our time and energy into something that, even in this world, loses its value, never mind that we can't take it into the next? So what is the contrast here? The contrast is storing up treasures for ourselves in heaven. Now what does it what is this? What, what are we talking about? Storing up treasures for ourselves. And the first point is that Scripture paints a picture that God, God is our treasure. He is our prized possession. And if we turn to a couple of Scriptures, this is indicated. So Philippians 3 verse 7 this is Paul talking, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever was gain is loss for the sake of Christ. Christ is more important. Also, when we flick to Hebrews, Hebrews 11, verse 26, and this is Moses. This is what Moses thought. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. We see here that scripture is clear that Jesus, Jesus Christ, is our true treasure. Jesus is our treasure. That if we devote ourselves our entire lives to him and to accepting the free gift of grace that Jesus dying on the cross for us, taking our sin and our shame, taking that punishment, defeating death, being resurrected for all who believe in him, that we might have eternal life, 
but also that we might have relationship with him now. He is the true treasure. And relationship with Jesus is something that can never be robbed from us. That is the true lasting treasure. And that's amazing because that's true today for all who believe and that will be true for all of eternity because our reward is in heaven, eternal life with him. And that's amazing. But we also see that it's not just about eternal life. As Duncan mentioned last week, there's also a scriptural principle of that we will be re rewarded according to how we live in today. What we do with our wealth matters. And when we look at Luke, Luke chapter 12, verse 33, which is um, also talking into this topic, um, this is what Jesus says. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourself money belts which do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Jesus is calling us to live a life of generosity. We should be generous with our money. We should be generous to the church because the church um, local church acts out um, a lot of the helping the poor and the needy the spiritually needy but also helps give to, to causes um, and good works in the community but we should also be giving ourselves generously and cheerfully to charities to social causes to the needy in our community that we see when we walk around the streets of our town where we live. Not because God needs our money. God created everything. He created all the currencies of the world. God doesn't need our money, but what we do with our money shows where our heart is, shows where our devotion is, our willingness to part and to be generous with our money shows that we're investing in treasure in heaven because that's where our reward will be. On to the second contrast, contrast between light and darkness. In verse 22 through to 23, the eyes are mentioned. The eyes are really important. Because our eyes on our body act as a focus point. So what we look at is where we're focusing in on. It's what's captivating our attention. But also what we set our eyes to is what direction we're heading in. I look towards where I'm going. That's where I want to be. And it's really important that eyes are mentioned here. So I want to ask you a question. What are you setting your eyes on? What are you set setting your gaze on? Are you setting your eyes on how you can get enough money to buy that next prized possession? Are you setting your eyes on how you can increase your bank balance to hit that target? And none of those things in themselves are bad. Saving is, is, is sensible, pragmatic. But when that overrides generosity, which is the call of Jesus on our lives as Christians, then we must think again. Or are you setting your eyes and your gaze on how you can raise enough money to sponsor a compassion child? Are you setting your eyes on how you can raise enough money to give a bit more to the church or to give a bit more to a good social cause? 
It's important that as Christians we think about this. Because it will affect our reward in heaven. And it will impact how we're rewarded. But most of all, it shows whether light is shining through our bodies. These verses are clear. That if what we're gazing on, if what we're thinking about and our focus is the treasure of God and being received in heaven, then light, light will shine. Life, purity, vitality, vibrance, that will shine through us. The alternative is that if we set our eyes on acquiring wealth and storing that up for ourselves, darkness will flow through us. As verse 21 says, where our treasure is, there is also our heart. And that brings us on to our third contrast. That we cannot serve God and wealth. Jesus is very clear that our devotion when it comes to wealth cannot be lukewarm. We must either be following God generously and be liberated and free to cheerfully give or instead money as our master. And that's very important for those of us that are Christians. We must, we, we call God our saviour, we call God our Lord, master over us, the one we follow and we devote ourselves to. But we must make sure that our, the pract practical nature of our life lives that out in the area of wealth. So I want to lay some challenges down to all of us. Perhaps, firstly, perhaps you look at yourself and you, you're thinking this morning and you're thinking, I, I'm not generous at all. I'm not giving my money to any of charity or the local church. I'm, I'm not generous with these things. I want to challenge you to think about this morning that according to your context, and it will be different for everyone, give according to what you can give. It's not about the amount. As with the, the woman who only had two pennies and gave one, Jesus sees your heart. He sees what you're, you're giving and what that means to you. But I want you to start today to consider that you should be generously giving because the riches of heaven will far surpass any material wealth that you can have in this world. Secondly, I want to challenge, challenge you if you, you are generous, if you are doing good things, if you are generously and cheerfully giving as, as Jesus challenges us to do to these things, I want to encourage you to think about how you can be more generous, how you can store up for yourself more treasure in heaven not to rest on your laurels and to just say I'm good at this, but to see how you can go above, above that and beyond. And finally, I want to, I want to speak to you if, if you're not a Christian. I want to be very clear. We don't want your money. God doesn't want your money. The invitation I'll put to you today is to consider investing your devotion and your time, energy and resources into the true treasure in Jesus Christ, that you might have eternal life with him. You might confess your sins and turn to him because that is the only true lasting treasure that cannot be robbed from us, that cannot be taken, cannot lose its value. And it's also a very, very liberating one.
I want to turn to the topic of anxiety and worry. And as I mentioned, they're very much linked. Anxiety is often caused by financial reasons. We see a lot of what's mentioned from verses 25 to 34, talking about material needs. Obviously, we need money to, to buy these things. We need these things to survive. And finances and lack of finances often can cause anxiety and worry. I read a survey that 80% of people, according to a, a Christian mental health sort of blog on Twitter, 80% of people have experienced anxiety during this crisis. And I imagine that for a lot that will be financial anxiety as well as health anxiety. And I find verse 34 really reassuring because Jesus is clear, we will encounter trouble. We will encounter difficulty. Reasons to be potentially anxious or worried. And I, I love the fact where scripture is very honest and clear about this. It doesn't paint the picture of a utopian life where there's never any wrongs and it's all perfect. It actually prepares us that it will be difficult. There will be troubles that we will face. But there are some amazing encouragements from these verses which Jesus gives us in order to try and contend with anxiety and worry as we face it. And also to be free so that we can try to live lives of freedom. It's just like we have, should have freedom from the hold and the grip of wealth on our lives. We should also seek to have freedom from anxiety and worry in our lives. And hopefully a few of these points will encourage us towards that. The first encouragement is in verse 25, where Jesus lists a range of material needs and then says, but isn't life about so much more? This draws us towards the fact that our greatest cause of anxiety, our greatest need to worry is if we're separated from God. Life, we were created for more than just eating, more than just being, existing and, and, and walking around and working. We were created to be in relationship with God. And because of the fall of man, because of the sin of my heart and the sin of your heart, the wrong we have done, we were separated from God. But for all of, it, all, all of us who have placed our trust in Jesus Christ, the great gap between us and God has been removed. The eternal separation that we faced has been completely wiped away. The greatest need for us to be anxious and to be worried about being separated from our Creator, from the treasure of life, has been, for those of us that have believed and put our faith in Jesus Christ, has been taken away. So that is the first encouragement when we're finding ourselves worried and anxious about the things of life, and it's not to belittle those, we'll come on to the second point, which speaks directly into those. Let's spend some time reflecting on the fact that God has been good to us, God has been gracious and merciful, and he has taken away our greatest need for anxiety and worry. The second point is, God is a compassionate provider. Verse 32 is really reassuring. Your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. God is not ignorant. He is not careless about the fact that we do need food. We do need clothing. We do need shelter. We do need money to pay for these things. He is not ignorant of those facts. In fact, he is a God who cares. And these verses bring out his care for us. They bring out his compassion and his love for us. And when I reflect on the God of Scripture, 
it's not a surprise because he has been a provider from the very beginning from when he was the creator in Genesis when he created the world he created everything but he also provided vegetation plants he created animals for us to to eat so that we have food he created these things so that we could have materials for clothing all sorts he is a god of provision i also like reflecting on scripture and one of my favorites is the israelites how when they were in the desert in the wilderness and god in his magnificent provision brought down food for them to eat out of the heavens he brought down food for them to eat day after day he is a god who has always provided and i think we can often drift through these verses from 26 through to 30 we can often think yeah i know god loves me more than a plant i know god loves me more than um grass i know he loves me more than animals even a bird but i think it's important for us to slow down it's important for us when particularly when we're feeling anxious and worried to actually dwell on these processes think and pause for a moment how magnificent it is how miraculous it is that the birds of the air are provided for think of how complex and difficult the process of a life of a lily growing going through its various stages of life is of grass of the field which is one day grown the next day not there think how much care and attention god has put into these things how much compassion he shows for these and the wonderful encouragement is that jesus says do you not know that i care for you more than these things you are more important than these things yet we see the magnificent provision of a compassionate god to these things yet he cares for us more so how much more will he provide for us and i know that to be true i know in my life probably one of the most anxious moments was when my wife temi who has anxiety medical anxiety she had to stop working work became too difficult for her she needed to take some time out and to rest and my first thought was i'm ashamed to say how am i going to afford how am i going to afford to live to pay my rent to pay my bills never mind to have the odd holiday and the odd nice treat with just one wage coming in that was the worry and the anxiety that gripped me and i turned to spreadsheets and focusing on how can i strategize about working my way out of of this situation but what brought me back was when i stopped those things because i realized they were hopeless there was no way i could strategize out of it and actually when i came before god and i threw myself before the compassionate provider and i said lord i'm helpless i need you and we need you to provide for us and wonderfully god did we never went a month without being able to pay our rent we never went without food we never went without clothing and i don't say that to boast but i say that to attest to the wonderful provision of god who came and met me and temi in one of our most difficult needs and it's really interesting because verse 27 also talks about actually the futility of worrying 
that it talks about and it says, and who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? It doesn't help. It doesn't achieve anything. So actually for us to allow ourselves to be consumed by anxiety and worry, whatever our need and, and the cause of that is, what we actually need to do is we need to do what verse 33 says, which is also what we need to do with our wealth. We need to devote ourselves entirely to God. We need to come before him and say, you alone are the one deserving of my worship, my time and my devotion. And out of these things, God can not only provide, but can bring freedom and bring liberation from anxiety and worry. And it's important that, of course, we believe in medical help and counsellors and, and, and all things like that. That is part of God's provision for us. But even within all of that, we must seek first God and seek first his will for our lives. And in doing so, God will not only provide, but he will take our, our worry and our anxiety away from us. So we see that Jesus is clear across these passages that he alone is the treasure. He alone is the treasure that cannot be robbed, cannot be taken, does not decay, does not lose its value. And it's as we fully invest ourselves in that, we put everything in our being towards storing up treasure for ourselves in heaven by devoting ourselves to the one and only treasure, which is Jesus Christ, but also going beyond that, out of that liberty, springboarding off of that wonderful fact that Jesus has done it all. He has taken away our greatest need for anxiety. We can then be generous because we need not fear. We need not fear because he is a God of provision. He is the compassionate provider we have an option, we have an option this morning of do we want to invest, invest in the treasures of heaven by seeking him with every aspect of our being or do we want to invest in wealth or do we want to be consumed by anxiety and wealth, things that don't last and don't lead to an eternal reward both that of being in heaven, but also the reward we will receive based upon how we've lived our lives. So take the amazing encouragement that Jesus calls us to live these liberated lives. Like Zacchaeus, he calls us to be driven on in generosity. For those of us that believe, let's be driven on to greater generosity that comes out of a heart of knowing what God has called us to and out of a devotion to, to be obedient and to bring reward for ourselves in the kingdom to come. And let us not be gripped by the lure of, of wealth in this world because it's short term and it won't last. And let us also seek to live lives that are free from anxiety and worry because he is the God who will provide. He is a God who has already eliminated our greatest need for those that know him and trust him in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that in your grace you sent down Jesus Christ to die a sinner's death, to take on himself the punishment for all of our sin and shame, but then to rise up and to be resurrected and to defeat death. Thank you that that is the true treasure that we can invest our lives in, that we can store up for ourselves treasure in heaven by seeking and devoting ourselves to. And I also pray, Lord, for your help, your help in allowing us, to, wherever we find ourselves as Christians, to be more generous with our wealth, to be more cheerful in our giving because we're investing in 
a reward to come in heaven, something that can't be taken from us, something that can't be robbed, doesn't decay, doesn't lose value. And I thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, for us as many members of your church battle with anxiety and worry, Lord. I thank you that you're a God who cares. I thank you that you're a God who's with us. Thank you that you're a God who has already provided so wonderfully and taken away our, our greatest need for worry and concern. I pray that you would be with all of us. And you would help us to live in greater freedom from the grip of wealth and the grip of anxiety on our hearts. I pray, Lord, in your holy name. Amen.